Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on groundwater for ecosystems, preserving biodiversity, socioeconomic, and cultural values. Uh, my name is Xander. I'm one of the presenters today, but uh, three of the five of us will be joining virtually, uh, including uh, Melissa Rohde, who um, will be giving some introductory remarks. So I'll just begin by uh, passing it off to you, Melissa. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Xander. And hello, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the session um, number 10, oh, 10363 on groundwater for ecosystems at this year's uh, Wa World Water Week. Um, this session is co-convened by myself, Melissa Rohde at the Nature Conservancy, Odd Sophie Rodella from the World Bank, and Rod uh, Benson from the University of Queensland. As many of you know, this, uh, this year the UN announced that this year's theme was about groundwater and the goal of making this precious invisible resource visible. Across the globe, groundwater is critical in supporting people and nature. And with more and more people turning to groundwater to meet growing water demands, especially within our warming climate, groundwater depletion is rapidly spreading across the globe. This is occurring despite the fact that 99% of liquid freshwater on earth is groundwater. And since, and that's mostly because sustainable groundwater management is limited to a few jurisdictions. So with a few laws in place to protect groundwater, Groundwater is not fully valued and equ uh, equitably shared, leaving the most vulnerable, such as endemic species and rural communities, um, at risk of losing water and exasperating their already fragile state. So in this session, we're going to hear talks from five different speakers and learn how groundwater supports ecosystems and how these ecosystems support rural communities. Second, we're going to learn new state-of-the-art methods to map and assess impacts to groundwater-dependent ecosystems. And lastly, we're going to hear a range of approaches to protect these ecosystems so that we can build resilience to climate change across the globe. So first up in the, uh, in the program is Rod Fensum, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Rod. And don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> Okay, you should be able to hear me now. Um, I'm going to start my talk with a little bit of a description as to how springs work. Um, if I can get the slides to change. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so they can either be quite local with the water going into a, usually a range of hills and popping out um, within the same vicinity. And so the water's had a fairly short, short residence time and hasn't traveled very far through the landscape. But when the water, uh, the right hand situation is where the water um, is traveling through a confined aquifer and the water becomes under pressure and can travel very long distances through the aquifer and pop out uh, in remote areas a long way away from where it is recharging and they're the springs that I get really excited about because they can occur in extremely arid landscapes and be watered by much more music conditions a long way from where they occur. This is um, the situation in Australia. This is our Great Artesian Basin. It's a big sedimentary aquifer and the water basically enters on those orange, more high rainfall margins and travels uh, underground through a confined aquifer and then pops up in springs where those red envelopes are and the ones in the southwestern part of the basin, the water molecules are thought to be a million years old by the time they pop out. And that's what they look like. They tend to leave behind salts that have accumulated um, in the groundwater. The groundwater is perfectly potable. You can drink it, but it has small concentrations of salts, which uh, concentrate around the springs and leave these um, classics or very uh, uh, clear sort of signatures of scalding country around those permanent wetlands. Uh, and they're kind of like islands in the middle of this sea of arid aridity um, and very remote from any other mesic landscapes. And uh, um, so under those conditions, we get um, evolutionary divergence and we get marvellous creatures that are endemic to those habitats. And in Australia, we've got a sort of like an ongoing tally of the things and you can see there's lots of plants 
fish, snails, crustacea, a dragonfly, some spiders and a flatworm um, that make up this extraordinary tally of species that are only known in those habitats anywhere in the world. Um, the Europeans discovered this pressurised aquifer and started drilling holes into it and the water coming came gushing out under great pressure, uh, was run down open drains to, to water these arid landscapes and uh, basically provide a water source for domestic livestock. But of course, in those open drains, most of the water um, evaporated under the uh, sunshine of outback Australia. Uh, we've been on a journey to sort of um, piece together the story of the springs and part of that journey is to locate the original locations and uh, because the springs disappeared with the release of the pressure, a uh, lot of them, we had to use historical maps and um, but they were very fundamental to the early settlement of our, the Australian continent so the maps are pretty good, they're marked on the maps, you can see here, Wigara Spring and Wigara Spring no longer exists. Um, and uh, so we've made a tally of them all and you can see there's a large number that are inactive, 30% of them, and another 27% that are partially inactive as a result of that decline in aquifer pressure. We've um, put the water coming out of those open bores um, into uh, engineered headworks and then distributed the water instead of down open drains through polythene pipe and we've spent a lot of public money doing that uh, in partnership with a private landholder contribution um, and um, trying to remedy the situation of that sort of profligate waste of all that precious groundwater. So here's one area where we've done some recent work. Uh, spring started going in in the 1880s, you know, more and more, uh, sorry, bores went in in the 1880s, more and more bores, flowing open drains, and then with this program, uh, the number of flowing bores, which are the blue things, have, have declined and uh, corresponding loss in aquifer pressure, you know, diminished by about 20 metres, you know, vertical metres of pressure. And we've recovered about six of those metres with our program. Uh, the springs, we lost lots, lots of the springs died. Um, but the ones that remain are getting bigger. So these are springs we've uh, monitored as a result of that restoration of aquifer pressures since 2008. And these springs of um, if this line here have doubled in size in 12 years. Um, there's other things uh, at much smaller scales that we need to do to protect springs. And um, some landholders, can have seen fit to excavate the spring wetland, which is, you know, that uh, wonderful ooze which has been sitting in those arid landscapes for, for uh, probably millions of years, evolving different life forms, and just in a weekend they can scrape them out and destroy them totally. So in the name of making sure that doesn't happen again, we've entered into lot, lots of um, what we call nature refuge agreements, basically agreements with landholders, to ensure that those things don't happen. And we've also got public reserves, so um, public and private reserves to protect the springs. And so this is what we've done in the last, uh, since the year 2000, all those little black arrows are either uh, conservation agreements or reserves that we've managed to acquire to protect springs. So they're sort of local conservation activities. Uh, one of the most important places is this place called Biari, which is now, um, conserved under uh, pri a private private national park, if you like, um, the Australian equivalent of the Nature Conservancy, effectively. And uh, we now protect those springs in a private conservation reserve. They're getting bigger because of the restoration of aquifer pressure. Um, one of the main conservation problems is that um, the fish, the endemic fish that lives at this place, which is this beautiful little thing called the redfin blue eye for obvious reasons, um, is getting preyed upon by this nasty fish from Mexico, which um, swims up those open drains and um, flips across the landscape when it's after big rainfall events, gets into the springs and literally eats the poor little redfin blue eye out of existence. Uh, so we're doing really cool things at the local scale on that property to 
restrict the movement of the gambusia and to try and eradicate them where we can. And we've perfected these, the engineering of um, these fish fences. Um, springs have enormous cultural significance um, around the world. This is uh, an image of the Oracle of Delphi who um, provided prophecy as the voice of Apollo in Greek civilization, as she sat near a spring. And some of us think that she was imbued with that power by the power of the spring. And, and the story of springs as um, powerful sites for providing prophecy is not just restricted to Greek civilization. It also happened in Egypt and it also happened in North America and indeed with Australian Aborigines. It's not the only sort of um, reoccurring cultural story about the power of springs. They're also, as we know, re been really important as sites for good health. You know, we get into springs and different springs for different health giving purposes. They are also recognized across cultures as place, places of, um, you know, really important places for as fertility, fertility sites. And there's other stories about the springs. Um, that recur across cultures, you know, like in many cultures, they're called the eye, uh, possibly the eye to the underworld. And of course, the stories of groundwater use that I've relayed to you from Australia reoccur across other countries. This is the pipelines of the Great Man Made Rivers project in Libya, which is transporting water from these um, probably fossilized aquifers in the Saharan desert to agricultural projects on the coast. Um, and the stories of the springs as really important repositories for biodiversity also occur across the continents. This is a really spectacular place for um, uh, high diversity of endemic organisms at Ash Meadows in Nevada. This is uh, another very important place for Biodiversity conservation, um, which is Cuatro Cienegas in Mexico. Um, so in response to these patterns that occur across the world and also the power of the springs, which hopefully I've demonstrated to, I want to build a, well, I am building a global project to protect the world's oases. Um, I've defined oases as permanent springs in mid latitudes with less than 500 metres rainfall. And I'm building a global database, which is basically a sort of like geospatial database of everything we know about springs in the literature. And this is a growing database. And this is um, um, a, a work in progress of where those uh, publications are represented around the world's oases. The yellow envelopes are the parts of the world with less than 500 millimetres rainfall. And I've also built a Fellowship of the Spring, which is a group of people who are interested in the topic. And we now have 27 members from 16 countries and we share our resources and try and help each other to progress our understanding of springs and how to conserve them. Uh, just to finish up with a few pickies, uh, this is um, Godamus in in Libya, which is a World Heritage listed oasis settlement. And um, it's, you know, beautiful desert architecture that's actually cooled by the waters of the spring. Uh, this is another site in Libya, out in the middle of the Sahara, uh, with some spectacular oases um, around the edge of a volcano. This is um, in the Baden Jaran Desert in uh, China. And that's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rod. I'm going to present next. Um, can you see my intro slide? Okay, great. Um, so, um, yeah, so my name is Melissa Rohde, as I mentioned earlier before, 
And um, I'm a groundwater scientist with the Nature Conservancy. And part of my job is ensuring that we are uh, in, ensuring that gr groundwater dependent ecosystems are getting acknowledged during groundwater management uh, uh, policy implementation in California, primarily where I uh, my work is based. Uh, but also, how can we trying to understand how can we uh, enhance protection for these ecosystems globally? And so a key step to accomplishing that is knowing you first need to know where these ecosystems are in order to protect them uh, and also understand which human um, societies are dependent on them, and which, which species are dependent uh, or residing in them. The issue is that uh, a lot of there aren't a lot of maps of groundwater dependent ecosystems in many geographies. And so to fill this knowledge gap, I'm going to share with you a global mapping project that, uh, that I've led. Uh, to map groundwater dependent ecosystems globally using satellite imagery and machine learning methods. And so this project was done in collaboration uh, with uh, colleagues of mine at the Nature Conservancy and also colleagues from the Desert Research Institute in Nevada, the University of Victoria, the World Bank, um, including two of our presenters today, Odd Sophie and Xander. So groundwater dependent ecosystems are species or ecological communities that depend on groundwater for some or all of their requirements. In, some, uh, in many cases, a species reliance on groundwater will vary in both time and space, and also on the, uh, depending on what key life processes they're undergoing. Um, so you know, it can vary from when they're growing to when they're reproducing to when they're migrating. And then also they can, um, the groundwater reliance can vary in response to climatic, climatic variability, such as seasonal changes in water availability and also extreme weather events such as drought. So it can be quite complex. Uh, reliance on groundwater is also indirect and direct. So for example, a groundwater dependent plant that accesses groundwater through its root are directly dependent on groundwater whereas the riparian birds that use that vegetation as habitat are indirectly reliant on groundwater. And so it's really important to understand these cause and effect relationships with groundwater and different plant, uh, plants and animals to really understand how groundwater is supporting or groundwater changes can impact that um, ecosystem. Um, and often groundwater acts as an important buffer for these ecosystems during drought and in dry summer periods, particularly in dryland areas of the world where surface water and precipitation are lacking seasonally. So because groundwater can sustain flows in ecosystems and create unique habitat conditions like Rod was describing, um, these groundwater dependent ecosystems are often biological hotspots supporting endemic species that can't be found anywhere else in the world. So if there are impacts to these um, ecosystems, you could potentially, it could potentially result in um, the extinction of a species because that, that's, that uh, ecosystem was supporting that one species. Um, they often, these ecosystems often provide the last refugia for threatened and endangered species. And, and so their protection is particularly relevant when we're trying when we're talking about achieving biodiversity targets globally. So other benefits that groundwater dependent ecosystems can provide include water purification, carbon sequestration, climate regulation, and recreational and subsistence and livelihood opportunities. And as we'll hear later uh, in the session from Otso Fee and Fiona, uh, these ecosystems also have a critical importance importance in reducing conflict in certain regions of the world. So to map groundwater dependent ecosystems globally, we created a random forest model in Google Earth Engine using a series of predictor variables um, um, using 30 meter Landsat uh, satellite imagery. The predictive variables uh, that we included uh, were things like evapotranspiration, precipitation, seasonal and annual vegetation indice data, like uh, normal difference vegetation index or normal difference water index, uh, land surface temperature anomalies, and topographic information. And so because groundwater reliance is easier to detect in regions with distinct wet and dry seasons, we constrain the extent of our model to dryland areas, which we defined using the Köppen-Geiger climate classifications. Um, we also restricted the model to regions of the world where 
relatively shallow groundwater exists. So we you use them, uh, we mass this out basically at 30 meters. And that was based on data, published data from a model from um, Fan et al. And, and then we, we use, using these data inputs, we created and trained a random forest model with the Google, within the Google Earth Engine platform. And we used about 30,000 training points to do this. The random forest models, um, they are able to take this data to classify individual pixels as being GDE, uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems or non groundwater dependent ecosystems um, based on a series of decision trees using the, da the data um, from the predictor variables. So here's a map of the training data that we use, about 30,000 points. And all these points consist of field based ground truths points of vegetation or aquatic features that are known to be a groundwater dependent ecosystems or not. And we also use barren landscapes um, to create more non-groundwater dependent ecosystem vegetation, uh, non-groundwater dependent ecosystem um, uh, uh, training points from land use maps. So here's our final map of, ground, of the global groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, in the pathable or the um, the World Water Week um, session info in the files, there's a link to an interactive map so you can zoom in and out of any areas of interest. So please go explore that later. Um, and uh, when, we, when we assessed the accuracy of our model, we found that it was 85% accurate, which is pretty good. And um, we found that land surface temperature the land surface temperature predictor variable was the most important predictor out of all the variables that we used. And as you can see here on the map, the majority of groundwater dependent ecosystems are in Asia, um, primarily Central Asia and um, Africa, the Sahel region. Our, our mapping reveals that groundwater dependent ecosystems are uh, likely present on 5.26 million square kilometers of global drylands, with nearly half, 47%, of global groundwater dependent ecosystems existing in Asia alone. Um, groundwater dependent ecosystems cover about 23% of total dryland areas that we use in the model and are present in, 20, uh, in 12 of the 25 global biodiversity hotspots. So the regions with the most contiguous groundwater dependent ecosystem areas happen to overlap not too surprisingly, in areas where there isn't a lot of groundwater development that's happened. And so they primarily exist on pastoral lands. So 78% of the ecosystems that we mapped are on pastoral lands. Uh, and this is most likely an indirect consequence of low rates of groundwater uh, extraction for irrigation, um, and which would mean that there's more shallow groundwater to support these ecosystems and less, um, you know, uh, loss of historic loss of these ecosystems. Um, for example, in agriculturally dominated and urbanized regions of the world, such as um, California, where I work, or in Australia, the, GD, the groundwater dependent ecosystems that we have are more fragmented due to historic land use changes and groundwater depletion that's happened over the past you know, um, decades. So our analysis shows that 76% of groundwater dependent ecosystems globally remain unprotected, and that 24% of the protected G groundwater dependent ecosystems are protected because they either exist in a preserve or a jurisdiction with sustainable groundwater management laws. But the actual effectiveness of that protection is still, you know, we still don't know how effective they're being managed and protected in those systems because groundwater depletion can occur from activities happening outside uh, beyond preserved borders. And that's something that Xander will be talking about later in the session. So globally, there's still a lot of work to do in order to protect these ecosystems um, and to achieve, uh, which is important for achieving biodiversity targets and climate goals. And uh, quite frankly, in a lot of these global discussions, groundwater is very little, is not very much acknowledged in, um, in, in, in the recognition of groundwater is not really acknowledged in um, achieving those goals. So because groundwater dependent ecosystems exist under varying regulatory regimes and societal contexts, there's a range of potent, uh, 
of protection and management strategies that we can employ depending on the enabling conditions and interconnections. Um, so this can include, you know, the traditional conservation, you know, protected area. So preserve a national park, uh, similar to what Rob was talking about in Australia. Uh, national uh, laws or policies such as sustainable groundwater uh, law or pol water policy or well permitting rules to more direct integrated policies. So things like uh, policy changes in the food, water, energy nexus. So change like this is something that's happened a lot in India where changing electricity prices or changing food prices can change groundwater extraction rates to more indirect policy, to interact in integrated policies such as that help alleviate food insecurity or poverty reduction. And we'll hear more about that from Odd Sophie and Fiona in a little bit. And then to more market-based mechanisms such as like water funds or ecosystem service things. So now I wanna uh, pass it off to Odd Sophie. She's gonna discuss how the GDE, this groundwater dependent ecosystem map can be used to inform pro programmatic and policy decisions in the Sahel. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm gonna start sharing my screen or hoping that someone will share my presentation. Um, there we go. Is this working? I'm hoping so. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. So this is really a nice segue into this presentation. So we are undertaking at the World Bank uh, a research on the economics of groundwater, building on the year of uh, groundwater, and, and, and really trying to push forward the economics part of it. And the reason being that most of the decisions that affect groundwater are actually happening outside of the water sector. And groundwater dependent ecosystem are especially a good case uh, to highlight. Um, let me, yes. I'm hoping that this is uh, continuing my screen. Learn about how the presentation is going for you. Um, but if not, Melissa will take over. I'll continue, I'll continue talking. So the way we are seeing uh, groundwater ecosystem is part of the discussion of what to prioritize. I mean, there is so many um, priorities uh, related to water and climate change and, and, and where to start. And the reason that groundwater came up is that in the context of country where groundwater potential is important, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, groundwater ecosystems are themselves very much at the crux of the decision that needs to be taken. And we are seeing groundwater eco uh, dependent ecosystem as really the canary in the gold mine, in the coal mine. And if you're seeing my presentation, there is this artifact uh, of canaries in coal mine that actually you would expect uh, to have died typically to, sh to show uh, that carbon monoxide was present in the mine. But in fact, you have some artifacts that have been built that were supposed to revive the, the canary. So this is a bit of an allegory of how we are trying to think about uh, ground dependent, uh, groundwater dependent ecosystem in trying to make sure that those that are already at risk, and this is part of, of my discussion here, uh, and, and those that could be at risk uh, with climate change further increasing uh, are, are being protected in, in a number of different ways. So uh, the, the, the reason that we care so much about it is, is that small variation in a groundwater, uh, uh, in, in the groundwater water table can really affect uh, groundwater dependent ecosystem. And that's true in terms of the quantity and the, and the quality. So there is more awareness about uh, the, 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 the biodiversity angle of this question, but much less about the socioeconomic dimension, at least not necessarily in a systematic manner. And the reason that this is the case is because there is actually a lack of data. And I think what we've seen today is the need for triangulation of, of, of data sources and data availability to really make the case uh, for, for the importance of groundwater dependent ecosystem, but more importantly, for the inclusion as part of um, of planning and, and protection. I'm really unclear about which slide you're seeing because I'm seeing two sets of slides. Is, is there a way, Melissa, you could confirm where I am? I, I'm really afraid I'm losing the audience. Uh, I can, where I, am, I can see the why should development partners care about GDE slide. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. So we'll continue from there. 
Um, so yes, so we we are, as uh, Melissa uh, mentioned, we are uh, working with the TNC with the data that the group developed to really make uh, use of this data in a way that can help with decision making, that really can help us systematically uh, talk about groundwater dependence ecosystem with a hope as well that it captures a broader discussion about groundwater. This also builds on some work that we were ourselves doing starting in the Sahel, and that's the map that you're seeing on the left, that were uh, out of, um, of, of secondary sources, primary sources, trying to document different type of GDs in the Sahel and has now been expanded to the rest of Africa where some additional validation are, are being done. And those different approaches are complementary and they really help in, in ascertaining the, 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 the likelihood of the presence of uh, of the GDE, which is again helpful from a planning perspective, understanding where they are, but also will be important in terms of decision that may be taken that would affect them. And why do we care more specifically about the Sahel and Africa? Because of course, we're a development organization here at the World Bank, and this is really uh, the, the, the true focus in terms of, of poverty reduction. 50% of the world poor live in Sub-Saharan Africa. The fragility of the Sahel needs no introduction, uh, but is especially heightened by fragility, demography, climate change. And so GDs are at, at the crossroads of many of those, uh, of those issues. And there is reason to believe that they require special attention uh, as uh, we've uh, dis not discovered, but as the analysis that we have done with the TNC further highlights. So for those that are familiar with uh, with the Sahel, that would come at no surprise that this is a region of really high uh, cross-border and transhumance and nomadism um, dynamics. And, and, and those are of historical uh, foundation, but they also have more recent uh, factors in, in the reason of uh, force or mini or voluntary migration for economic or for fragility uh, reason. And, and most of those are crossing borders. So that's it, when we connect it back to the GD that really present some challenges in terms of protection of, of, of the GD. What we see when we look at the data from the TNC uh, on, on, on groundwater dependent ecosystem is how in the cell in particular, we're seeing uh, uh, um, uh, some hotspots, well-known hotspot of fragility uh, uh, emerging. And so that's important because those are priority area in terms of, of development and in terms of humanitarian intervention. For instance, you're seeing the Mali, Burkina and Niger uh, cluster, which is known as the tri-border area. This is a region that concentrates a lot of effort from a humanitarian and development perspective. And we're seeing that a lot of GDs are also concentrated in this, uh, in this area. And, and again, it makes sense from a pastoralist uh, perspective, from historical reasons, from the climate perspective. But these data allow us to factor that in much more systematically moving forward. Well, at least that's the hope and that's the sensibilization that we hope to be able to be doing through this work and through um, the availability of data moving forward. So that it's not just a discussion that happened in the environmental space or in the water space, but, it, but it's really taken in a much more multi-sectoral way. And, and, and as you can see, this is also true from other clusters of Sahel hotspots, uh, you know, the Nigeria, uh, Niger, Cameroon, Chad borders, that's the Lake Chad uh, region, the Chad Sudan region, the Sudan, uh, uh, Sudan South Sudan region. So those are areas that experience really high level of population movement uh, that adds on uh, to, to existing movement of uh, traditional uh, movement of uh, population in the region. And so from so that means that understanding and, and, and being able to document what is going on to groundwater dependent ecosystem will have a lot of importance uh, uh, in, in terms of either not worsening the situation in terms of fragility, also in terms of the solution uh, to, to, um, to, to address the, the, the vulnerability of the population that more directly depend on those uh, groundwater dependent ecosystem. And those clusters are also clusters of food insecurity. And of course, the current situation um, uh, in terms of uh, global, um, uh, global uh, stability and, and climate change is known to be a further of concern for food insecurity in this region. So again, probably uh, additional factors that will cause stress on those uh, groundwater ecosystems with potentially um, uh, loop, a uh, negative loop that could affect the long-term sustainability of those places and, and have negative consequences on some specific group 
typically rural, typically pastoralists that would be directly reliant for their livelihood on this. So this is of very big importance for us at the World Bank from a development, inclusion, uh, exclusion, inequality perspective. And we really are trying to um, to use uh, the, the, the different initiatives happening and those that we're ourselves leading to go beyond advocacy, to really have a, uh, a data enable us to have a systematic inclusion of groundwater dependent ecosystem in diagnostic, in planning, in accounting uh, better for their socioeconomic importance so that also some of the intervention that are taken outside of the sector, be it in environment, be it in agriculture, be it in mining, be it in a number of ways do not have uh, negative externalities on those groundwater dependent ecosystems. So that's, there, there is really a do no harm um, uh, uh, logic to it, but beyond that, what could be done also to, to protect those, uh, those groundwater dependent ecosystems is also part of the discussion. So uh, as I said, you know, we are looking at the analytics, of course, that's always uh, uh, very important to us. And this is part of the research that we're doing. The project and intervention uh, dimension in uh, for the World Bank, but also for the partner is, is how can we have a more coordinated approach that better factor in GDEs. And on the policy reform side, it's also what are the type of policy instruments that needs to be in place, the type of reform from the, the countryside that, that are needed to uh, recognize and to protect those. And actually, this is a discussion that is happening now in Niger as part of budget support that we are uh, going to provide to the government of Niger. And this discussion is, is, is precisely being uh, initiated to, 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 to better include um, uh, groundwater dependent ecosystem in the planning, in the, 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 the discussion that are happening around the expansion of the use of groundwater uh, uh, in general, especially for small scale irrigation and water supply. So this is the end of my presentation. I will pass over to Fiona, who is also going to be providing uh, a perspective on the way that UNICEF will be thinking about groundwater and groundwater dependent ecosystem in their own work. Thank you so much. It's Thursday after, sorry, it's Wednesday afternoon. Uh, it feels like uh, Thursday. I know this has been a long day. Um, this is a little break. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical aspects. There is uh, a lot has been said. Um, just here from UNICEF. My name is Fiona Ward. I'm a water, I'm a, a hydrogeologist, but um, my focus in UNICEF, I'm based in UNICEF's headquarters in New York, is on uh, climate resilient water, uh, water and sanitation services, uh, water security, as well as uh, solar. Um, I'm here today because it's really just to highlight the impact of even, as you've heard, of even small changes in groundwater and on the communities. Uh, and just to highlight that um, we've done some studies to say that 420 million children live in areas of conflict and fragility. And there is a lot of overlap with the maps that you've just seen in terms of the GDEs. Uh, last year, we did um, a, a quick analysis um, on um, the impact, uh, basically the relationship between water, physical water risks and the uh, service level. And you'll see that along in, in the Sahel, there is a very high relationship. And it was from this study, it showed that 450 million children are living in areas of high and extremely high water vulnerability. So just to highlight that many of the GDEs are already, as you've heard, in um, in fragile areas. And but also um, we've also heard that these areas are not highly are not currently being abstracted very much in terms of they're often in pastoral areas and with climate change and the increasing competition for water resources, this is going, this can have a really huge impact on um, the people who depend um, upon these uh, water sources, but also the livelihoods opportunities around it. And then of course the impact you have for potential for water and uh, conflict. So why is our program interested in this? Basically um, we're trying to improve the development levels and the health and the outcome levels for children. And there's a huge relationship between water and fragility. And then, of course, as we've seen increasingly in terms of conflict, tension and um, the, in, the impacts of reduced livelihoods, the, also the impact of increased costs for water and then the household costs associated with that. And then, of course, which leads to migration and the interruption of services for children. Um, in terms of groundwater decline, when water sources are impacted and um, it affects the amount of time it collects to uh, it takes to collect water but not just in terms of the physical distance there's the waiting time you know that there's different service levels for different types of water a basic level is 
um, an improved water source and collection time within 30 minutes. So as more people, as other sources fail, more people come to different areas, the, the queues increase and the tension and the competition increase. I think when we talk about climate change on water resources, we tend to, to impact or to think about the impact in terms of declining or changing um, recharge rates, but actually it's also important to consider the changes in water demand going forward and how do you uh, predict those. Um, as, as we've seen, a lot of the most vulnerable areas um, are dependent upon uh, 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 groundwater dependent ecosystems, but also in terms of the, of the people in the community who are dependent upon these. So any small changes will have an impact at a household level. However, there are many positives. We have, we're doing some uh, programming in terms of uh, uh, peace analysis and co conflict analysis and actually um, improved sustainable wash services can act as peace rewards in in communities and also really help their um, resilience but when they're not designed properly because often there is a sense that well if you will improve people's lives if you go from a hand pump to a solar system but actually can have the opposite impact if it hasn't been designed uh, properly so this is a, a huge thing in terms of the the communities that it can cause um increasing the level of service while it is important it has to be done uh, properly um so just saying that there is a really, really strong relationship between the level of service in a community and their resilience however it's making sure that this is done in a sustainable way because these, especially in areas which are most affected by um, climate change and the most vulnerable. So um, what areas that we are looking at doing and suggestions for uh, the WASH sector and programming is, um, as we've also heard from Aud Sophie and what we heard also from uh, Melissa in terms of the policy, what can we do in terms of advocacy and governance? How do we mobilize um, awareness on their vulnerability. I'm not sure whether many of you are aware of what a national adaptation plan is. Okay, so basically um, there's a, a sense in the WASH sector that uh, climate finance can solve a lot of problems. However, if um, the relationship between, uh, so the, the national Ad adaptation plan determines the uh, level of priority in a country of certain climate risks. So, so far, actually, the WASH sector has not been well represented. And also, and then you'll find that this then determines which options there are for climate finance. So there are technical solutions available um, that could qualify for climate finance, but because they haven't been listed as a national climate priority, they are then not um, feasible. So it's a advocacy to highlight what are the linkages between uh, WASH services, the vulnerability of communities, how their lives are impacted by climate change and extreme events, and getting these um, into important key national documents. But importantly, getting these into national WASH strategies, often there is a focus on other aspects of water resources, but not necessarily looking at to the um, very, very shallow uh, groundwater systems. Um, we are also scaling up in terms of our groundwater assessments, but also trying to look at future predictions for water demand and uh, predictions in terms of water levels. Uh, we are recently getting involved in early warning systems. It's not an area where UNICEF has worked in before. We are um, scaling up our remote monitoring of systems, but also how, for example, working in Mauritania, there's lots of different agencies also working uh, in terms of groundwater monitoring, but also how do you get these to come together under a national system? As I mentioned, the importance of advocacy, but also in terms of capacity building to understand the resilience, uh, the impact of climate and extreme events on wash services. Also, even in areas where which are suffering from extreme climate impacts and climate change and water uh, scarcity, often there's an association of the value for water and the abstraction level. So even in areas where there are threats to water, um, there is because of the how much people pay, um, there's a there, there can be um, a, a situation where people are not valuing water and they're abusing it and it's not being uh, properly protected. So we're also working a lot in that. Um, where the yield allows, we're also looking at connecting 
water sources to livelihood opportunities, which helps in terms of the availability um, and the sustainability of these services, but also because it's linked to livelihoods, then there's um, more funds available for operation maintenance of uh, water systems, which means that then people are will are can pay for the operation maintenance, but also then it just kind of people see that it's important that these systems keep on functioning, which then reinforces the importance of um, managing the, the groundwater. And then that, of course, feeds into the groundwater governance and the policies there's a lot of potential in terms of skill development. Um, certainly, we have a number of programs for youth engagement in the Sahel because often there is limited employment opportunities. So a lot of people are then um, looking to see what other options there are with uh, different criminal groups. So looking at uh, options in terms of working with the private sector for skill development. And as I mentioned, uh, we have um, the, the focus then on climate and uh, of the conflict analysis. This is a new area which UNICEF is working in. We're developing some guidance on this, how to identify the, the potential, first of all, the vulnerability of wash services to climate. How can climate, um, sorry, how, how can uh, our wash services uh, trigger already very, very fragile situations and what can be done then to minimize the impact of this. So that's it from me. Thanks so much. Over to you. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, we're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule, so I think we're setting up for a nice uh, Q&A period. And as well, I believe that Odd Sophie was intending on sharing some, some maps of these hotspots that she was talking about and the, the slides weren't updating, so maybe we'll have time to, to go back to those to, to get some visuals um, that, that sort of um, underpin a lot of the narratives that um, she was speaking about. Yeah, so uh, my name is Andrew Huggins. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate uh, from the University of Victoria on the west coast of Canada and at the Global Institute for Water Security in the Canadian Prairies um, and at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna. And um, the work I'm sharing today is on a deeply collaborative project. So um, I did take a co-leading role, but it's really the work of, of all the co-authors that you can see on the screen. And it's around mapping the, the ground watersheds of the world's protected areas. And we'll get more in, into more of, of what that means uh, throughout the talk. Um, but first, I just want to make a, a clear conceptual uh, connection here. A lot of this uh, the in entire session has been really around um, groundwater dependent ecosystems. And, and I'll use the acronym GDEs uh, during the talk. But these GDEs uh, abound in global protected areas and in other areas that may not be protected but are of ecological significance. So uh, here on the left, we can see um, a photo of the Okavango uh, Delta in uh, South Af uh, Southern Africa. And one of the main tributaries to the Okavango, um, or, or most of the, the tributary rivers to the to the Okavango River, are dependent on groundwater discharge and the form, or, or base flow, as it's called, to sustain their stream flow through the year, and thus provides a uh, in, uh, critical input um, to this uh, to this uh, critical um, uh, ecosystem. On the right hand side of the screen, um, we can see a map. That, uh, they might be a little bit small to see in the room, but on the right hand side, these are maps of. Uh, Ramsar wetlands, so UNESCO designated uh, uh, wetlands of international importance. What have been pulled out in, in these maps are um, the Ramsar wetlands that have a, a clear link uh, to, to groundwater processes. And so we can see both the, the global scope and extent of these groundwater contributions to these wetlands. And in our analysis that I'll be sharing today, we found in uh, about 86% of all protected areas globally that there's a, there's a clear uh, mechanistic link um, between uh, groundwater processes uh, and, and protected areas. So these really do abound um, around the world. Um, and, and, and this dependence on, of protected areas on, on groundwater means that groundwater misuse both within and, and, and proximate to protected areas poses um, often an overlooked risk to, um, to protected initiatives and protection targets. So again, I'll use an illustrative example, this time in the south, south of Spain in the Doniana uh, National Park and World Heritage Site, um, and in this uh, and in this protected area, there's been um, detrimental impacts of groundwater pumping uh, for irrigation of cotton, rice, and and strawberry um, plants uh, that are occurring outside of the bounds of the of the protected area, but are directly uh, affecting um, 
the ecology within the bounds of the protected area. And so the underlying narrative here is that it's important, really important to include groundwater flow um, and processes uh, in our conceptualization of well, what it means to protect an area. But this, um, this is not always the case, of course. Um, and, and so I just provided an illustrative example um, in the Doñana uh, National Park, but the, the global potential um, for human activities to impart negative impacts on protected areas through uh, groundwater flow has not been uh, estimated or quantified globally. And so that's what we set out to do as, as our um, co-authorship team. And to do that, we applied this concept of, of groundwater sheds to the protected areas. So maybe you haven't come across this term before and it might sound familiar. So I'll just give um, uh, 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 an, uh, an overview of what a groundwater shed means. Um, I'm assuming I all have heard of surface watersheds uh, that, that define a, a, a catchment area or a contributing area of overland runoff and stream flow to a, to a feature of interest and are derived based on the, um, the land surface topography. Uh, similarly, groundwater sheds are derived based on the uh, topography of the water table as well for, for a feature of interest, and they identify the contributing localized groundwater flow systems to, to a feature that, that we care about. Um, and of course, this concept can be applied to, to any feature of interest, but in this instance, we're applying it to, um, to protected areas. And, and, and three real uh, uh, process-based uh, mechanisms that link groundwater to uh, 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 surface features and ecological functioning um, at the land surface. And so these are highlighted in red circles in this uh, cross-section di uh, diagram on the, on the right of your screen. And so these processes are groundwater uh, discharge to surface water. So we looked at um, perennial streams and, uh, and, and other surface water bodies, as well as groundwater-driven wetlands and regions where um, the, the rooting depth or the root zone taps into, taps into the water table. So based on um, these three um, yeah, process-based mechanisms. That's the; those are the features of interest that we're that we're focusing on within the protected areas of the world. So to move out of the conceptual space and into um, into a worked example, um, we'll return to um, Australia. This is a nice bookend with how our talk started um, with some examples from Australia. So this is in Northwest Queensland, um, and so in dark black, what you're seeing are the uh, extents or the boundaries of uh, various protected areas. And the white circles you're seeing are areas where we've identified a link between groundwater processes and um, ecological processes. Those are the red circles in that conceptual diagram on the bottom right. And then in blue, what you're seeing are the contributing areas of localized groundwater flow that feed, um, that feed into these, um, these cells that are denoted by these white circles. And so when you, when you see a, a blue area that's outside of this, this thick, Black boundary, those are areas where groundwater is being recharged and flowing into protected areas, but the, those recharge and, the, and that portion of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the flow system is not within, um, yeah, within the protected area. And then has, uh, of course, there are different levels of human activity that can occur or are permitted to occur um, in those lands and are typically then an overlooked uh, potential risk. So we applied this concept globally. So I'll, I'll just uh, um, provide some high level um, global statistics and takeaways. The first is really simple. It's just these groundwater sheds are really, really big. Uh, we looked at over uh, 12 and a half million square kilometers of protected areas and their associated contributing groundwater flow area was 83% larger or about 23 million square kilometers. Um, we also looked at a bit of um, some of the behavior of, uh, and drivers of what, what makes a groundwater shed larger or, or, or smaller. And we found that in, um, in more arid regions. So here in this map, this is an indicator we came up with called relative groundwater shed size. So we could compare these groundwater shed sizes um, regardless of the, of the size it, it itself of the protected area it's associated with. Um, and, and what you're seeing is these, these more pink colors are larger groundwater sheds and in blue are smaller groundwater sheds. So we're seeing really large uh, contributing groundwater flow areas, uh, of course, in the American Southwest and in uh, South Africa and across Australia um, and across the Sahara and Middle East, um, which uh, makes sense um, based on um, published literature on drivers of, of, of regional groundwater flow. So uh, it, it follows from this that not only if, if groundwater sheds are big and much bigger than the protected areas, this means that they're also mostly unprotected. So we found that um, over 80% of all protected areas in the world have some portion of their contributing groundwater flow uh, um, and groundwater shed that's unprotected. So this applies to five out of six um, 
about five out of six uh, protected areas globally. And that on a, on a, a, a when summarizing to total surface area, about 52% of these groundwater sheds are unprotected. So here we can see some worked examples um, in uh, a more humid region, such as Central North America. So this is Northwestern Ontario for anyone from, from North America, and it has an unprotected ratio. So this is the ratio of the groundwater sheds that fall within protected jurisdiction or boundaries. And it has a, a relatively lower unprotected ratio of 39%. Whereas if we look in the Iberian Peninsula, we're seeing, which is also more arid, we're seeing an unprotected ratio uh, above, six, uh, above 60%. Um, the other thing I want to note on this slide is that there's no clear um, geographic trends in the levels of protection of these groundwater sheds. And this, for me, indicates that there's no uniform effort uh, or there's uniform uh, lack of consideration, we should say, around um, including uh, groundwater processes in how we conceptualize um, protected targets and protected area delineation. But uh, like I said at the start, we wanted to not only map out the extent of uh, groundwater sheds, and, um, but look at the, the, the potential risk posed by human activity. And so the next stage of our, our work was to look at the, the extent of human activity that's occurring within these unprotected um, portions of these groundwater sheds. Um, and to do this, we used a, an already published uh, composite indicator from a, from a separate authorship group, uh, and it's called the Human Modification Gradient. But it... Uh, it combines um, a bunch of different uh, forms of human activity. These inc include human settlement, agriculture, uh, transportation, uh, and you can read the, less, uh, the rest of the list. And this is what's plotted in this panel A here. Um, and so this reflects yes, so the, the extent of uh, human activity or the human pressures, we could say, that are occurring um, on top of these unprotected groundwater sheds. And what this bivariate approach does, so if we compare this level of human activity to the level of protection within these groundwater sheds. This would uh, allows us to build more more narratives and nuance to um, potential path pathways forward. Um, and so, figures here B and C go hand in hand, um, where we compare the level of unprotection or uh, the unprotected ratio. This is on the x-axis with the human activity levels on the y-axis. And so now, if we switch our attention over to the map. We're seeing regions that are in red overwhelmingly have unprotected groundwater sheds, but really high levels of, of human activity. So um, uh, likely the most vulnerable uh, protected areas um, for the processes that, that we're considering. Conversely, in yellow, we're, and, and these also correspond with um, arid regions and less, less populated regions, we're seeing uh, high levels of, of um, or low levels of protection but also low levels of human activity. And of course, this will dictate um, what's feasible in terms of proactive versus reactive um, um, management uh, strategies. The last, form of, uh, last bit of analysis I'll touch on is, I uh, really wanna preface this by saying it's more of a, more of a thought experiment, but we were interested in uh, the potential global application of this groundwater should concept to um, uh, to meet uh, global uh, area-based conservation targets. And so the two that we honed in on were the Aki biodiversity target 11, that called for 17% of global terrestrial um, uh, land and, and, and water area to be protected um, by 2020, and the uh, 30 by 30 target that calls for 30% protection by the year 2030. And so this thought experiment that we uh, conducted was what if just all of these unprotected groundwater sheds received protected status? Of course, this is not feasible, but um, helps us to, to investigate the, the uh, maybe greatest potential application of the concept. And so what we're seeing now in this map is, is um, the, the um, degree of protected, um, protected areas, including currently protected areas and um, currently unprotected groundwater shed areas of those protected areas. So if you're uh, the countries and at the, at the summarized to, to the national scale. So if you see a country in dark green, that means either by the addition of these two or, or by current um, levels of protection alone, those countries would already meet or surpass the 30 by 30 initiative. Whereas the countries that are more across this green gradient, they would surpass the IKE 2020 target of 17%, but would not yet meet the, the 30%, uh, 30 by 30 target. And then the countries in uh, across orange to yellow would still not meet these conservation targets, um, even if including all of these groundwater sheds. Um, Ah, 
yeah maybe to dive into later uh in our work but um and I, th that leads me though to a good um um caveat to put is this is of course predicated on the input data that drive this analysis and so um the world database on protected areas is what we use to um as our spatial basis for existing protected areas and the degree of protection um of course uh, uh is based on the level of reporting of these protected areas uh in this database so that's an asterisk to put um on the side of that slide at least <clears throat> okay so that's the end of my talk i'll just summarize with three uh take-home messages so the first is um just very simple that inc incorporating these considerations around groundwater flow um in uh Conserva uh, land uh, um, based uh, conservation targets uh, will make them, um, I think, only more, more robust. Secondly, we um, map the groundwater sheds of, of the world's protected areas. And, and like Melissa said, this, this is the year of, of groundwater and making the invisible visible. And so we're hoping to daylight this connection between groundwater flow and protected areas, which is all underpinned as well by um, groundwater dependent ecosystems. And the third main take home message is that um, the groundwater sheds of the world's protected areas are largely unprotected and um, and how we address this, of course, will will um, require not global scale analysis, but con contextual um, place based analysis and more process based um, modeling, but um, but certainly as a call to action and raising awareness around um, uh, around this uh, overlooked risk. So that's the end of my talk. And that also brings us to a close on all of our speakers. So yeah, thank you for listening. And um, so now, so we're about, yeah, 10, still 10 minutes ahead of schedule. So we have uh, a nice 25-ish or more minutes for Q&A. So we can open up the floor if anyone would like to raise a hand. Yes. And okay, good. We have our panelists on the screen. And they can hear in the mic now, is that right? Okay. Yeah, we can hear. Thank you very much. My name is Abdurrahman Sultan. I'm from EcoPeace Middle East. I'm from Jordan myself. And uh, I cannot agree more with the results uh, that have been presented. Uh, my concern is um, the, the cost of having unprotected groundwater in some of the countries is really massive uh, in a negative way. Uh, it might lead to social unrest or social uh, or demographic uh, change. And uh, at the moment, uh, we're witnessing that in some countries, protection of groundwater is possible, but in some other countries where we need to rescue society by drilling more groundwater wells to uh, make them alive, we make the, the problem uh, bigger and bigger. And I'm asking what could be the recommendation in such cases where we already know that the recharge rate is minimum and the society is growing. Uh, so it's the cycle is not getting smaller; it's getting uh, larger. Uh, this is pro probably it's a, a recommendation or policy thing that government should react. But I don't know. Sometimes uh, aid agencies and the general uh, institutions, uh, large institutions, try to save society where they are, but uh, we cause a larger problem rather than uh, make this, uh, the problem smaller. Probably UNICEF also can contribute to that. <laughs> Maybe we can all maybe weigh on, in on this. Does anyone want to take the first um, stab at it? But uh, Odd Sophie, go ahead. Thank you so much. No, I think this is very much on point, and I think that's a nice uh, also segue from Xander's uh, presentation. So clearly, protection is very important, but there are many countries where the context is rather unfavorable uh, to, 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 to policy implementation. So, and there are many reasons why there will be competition uh, for the resource that will be affecting the, the, the groundwater dependent ecosystem and in general, the sustainability of groundwater. So uh, I think that's where you know, global partners uh, adopting a more systematic approach about it and coordinating action can really help uh, countries in, in that department. And, and a lot of the solutions are not, are not quite in the policy area. They are in all the other decisions that are taken in the economic space uh, that have an implication in agriculture, you know, so for irrigation, in water supply. And it's really about 
one, the awareness about what's going on, the, the, the availability of data so that you can see the, the, the situation as it is and you know, how uh, you want to, 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 to go about it. And, and frankly, a deliberate approach about it. A lot of the things that are happening in the groundwater space are actually by default and they are fragmented in, in the decision. So we're missing the, the overall um, aquifer dimension and how it affects uh, groundwater dependent ecosystem and the, and the broader sustainability of the resource. And I think that's where we really have a role, you know, as a partner that, that deals with a number of different sectors in really helping to, uh, to nudge a discussion to prior to, to bring the awareness at a higher political level so that the decisions are really made uh, with, with an understanding of the implication uh, for, for, for the resource and the broader ecosystems that depends on it. So uh, I, I fully concur with what has been said. It's really not easy at all. And there are some decisions you know, in, in society that, that face conflict, that face fragility. You know, GDs may not be very high on the priority list, but what we're showing through the data and the type of discussion that we'll be having is that actually it's quite mesh in the, 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 the dynamics at play. And it is important to, uh, to, to, to realize that so that, you know, decisions that are made or, you know, interventions that are being proposed do not have a, a negative effect uh, that was not anticipated. So there, I think a lot of the, the talk today is about, you know, making that visible, proposing also, uh, uh, you know, concrete data so that this is being more systematically included. And that, that goes a long way in terms of, uh, of finding pragmatic approaches that can be helpful to protect those uh, those groundwater dependent ecosystem and more broadly groundwater and the type of social and environmental benefits it provides. Thank you. Shukran Jazilan for your message. Um, I've been very lucky to work in a number of countries in the Middle East. Um, but just to say a couple of things from my side, I mean, often there is an interest in building new infrastructure rather than repairing what is there already in terms of reducing leakage. One thing in the different countries I've worked in is in terms of the perception of water being linked to tariff systems. I know it's highly political and highly sensitive, but I, I mean, one thing that I did find that a lot of water is wasted because it's associated with it being very cheap or else there's a block tariff system, which complicates matters and, and the, the, the perception. But also, I mean, I think especially I think in Jordan, like 80 percent of the water is used for agricultural purposes. So I think it's also just looking at, you know, it's also advocacy and um, looking at innovations for different crops or different types of agricultural systems and different trends, especially. And, and also, I think um, cost of inaction studies, like what will happen? What is the impact in different countries in terms of if nothing is done in terms of protecting the groundwater resources? So I think there is a lot of things to build up the narrative, but also I think increasingly um, donors are asking questions as to why more boreholes instead of you know looking at improvements to efficiency for current systems, which also of course lends itself to benefits for more energy efficiency in terms of reduce all operation maintenance costs as well. So I think there's a lot of uh, potential, but it'll, it'll be a long journey. Thanks so much for your question. Rod, Melissa, anything to add? I guess just adding really quickly, I agree with everything that Otto B and Fiona said. I, it is, I think the most important thing to do is to understand all of the interconnections. A lot of water policy decisions are made in silos. And um, it's in order to ensure that you're reducing trade-offs and maximizing like the benefit for as many people as possible, you have to understand those direct and indirect, the direct and the indirect linkages between different um, uh, policy. So whether it's an agriculture or electric or energy or in poverty reduction or um, transportation, like it's all interconnected with groundwater in these ecosystems. And so the first thing is to really understand, have a conceptual model of how things are connected and then developing integrated policies that can, that can um, resolve the, the issues that you're trying to solve locally. And it's gonna, it varies in every different context. Um, so that's why it's complicated. But that was my hope with like creating this map is that we can at least bring this new data into those decisions so that we can better understand how to protect them and also achieve other um, societal goals at the same time.
<clears throat> yes, my, my name is Mark Taganini from the European Space Agency. I must say that I'm impressed by the work you've done because you also use some, some satellite imagery. But the questions I have, because I was not aware of such work, I must say, and uh, at the end of the year, Ramsar will, well, in November, Ramsar will have his cup with his conference of the parties. And then we have also the convention on biodiversity, the CBD will have his cup. Uh, with a new biodiversity um, framework, global biodiversity framework, and uh, and monitoring systems, and, uh, and a number of indicators will be will be defined. So, so lots of happening on the policy sector at the end of the year. And, and I was just wondering how um, how high in the agenda are the, the these groundwater depending ecosystems on both Ramsar and the CBD. To be honest, I. Uh, I am involved in both, and I, I haven't seen much. It's clear that in Ramsar, one water is relevant to many of, 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 of the wetlands. But, um, but having a dedicated, I don't know if there will be a dedicated resolution uh, specifically to the, to the groundwater dependent ecosystems. But uh, I, I mean, it would be nice if you could clarify a bit this and wh wh what you expect actually from these two cups. Thanks for your question. Um, I, to be honest, I'm not expecting much, <laughs> it was just why we are having this session and also um, this the motivation from behind this work. Um, I think the challenge is that, you know, in line with this whole UNESCO theme, um, groundwater being um, invisible and trying to make it visible is that um, we don't even know where these ecosystems are, like even within the nature conservancy, we have a we have a very strong focus on rivers and wetlands and you know the things that we see on the ground which is our groundwater dependent ecosystems it's just that we don't understand the linkage that this uh, how much groundwater is supporting these ecosystems and so even internally we've been trying to elevate the importance of groundwater for these ecosystems and so i think i I would love to, if you want to talk afterwards if, uh, about how we could we could integrate um, this data, that would be great. But I, I th that's the whole point. It's like if we are if we have all these biodiversity goals and we have all these climate goals, but we're not acknowledging the importance of groundwater in sustaining these ecosystems, and pumping is happening simultaneously through other initiatives or other develop uh, or for profit, we could be undermining. The, we could be undermining those efforts. And so it's what I'm hoping that we can accomplish is that we can really under, um, uh, raise awareness around how important groundwater is, especially with a warming climate in sustaining these ecosystems. And that if we want to achieve these other larger goals, we need to um, account for groundwater and manage that usage so that we're not undermining those efforts. Atsavi, did you want to add on to that? Yes, yes. No, I, I'm totally on the same page at that. I, I think, frankly, you know, with all those conventions who have a very important role at the advocacy level, you know, for most of the country we've been talking about, uh, you know, th this is not necessarily going to be changing all that much concretely. But again, the, the, the advocacy needs to, to really take into consideration the specificity of the context, why we should care about it, you know, wh why does that actually make sense for this specific uh, situation, why that has to be incorporated in a broader discussion about about the use of the resource, and it is not a doom and gloom situation necessarily, but it has important societal repercussion that needs to be known, that needs to be factored in. And I think that resonates pretty well with uh, with uh, with our um, counterparts when, when we uh, take the position of why it is that it should be a priority among the 10,000 other things that they have to, to, to prioritize and, and how does that connect. And really the starting point is to, you know, is to have the, the information about it and, and, and for, for it to be, uh, to be followed. And, and that's also the type of technical assistance that a number of us can, uh, can can provide and a sustained one at that, and and that is way beyond any type of uh, of, of of agreement that they would be taking uh, more globally. Because uh, again, they're just competing priorities, especially in in, in those uh, in the Sahel, but especially in other uh, countries that that face uh, climate change at, at at such a high cost. So, uh, but yes, I like Melissa. I'm more than happy to discuss that uh, further um, further with you guys. Thank you. Hello. 
Uh, thank you for a good session. Uh, I'm Rohini. I'm the junior reporter for this session. I'm a recent uh, young graduate. So uh, Xander mentioned that uh, all unprotected, unprotected areas can't be uh, protected by regulation or law. Is there something that can be done in those sites uh, to conserve the groundwater ecosystem? That is the first question. And another one is that uh, I come from India. So uh, in countries like India, where there are uh, there is a lot of uh, community efforts and uh, there is a scope that communities can come together and work, it is easier. And there are a lot of uh, uh, rural areas. So. Uh, do you think with proper education, mentorship, and guidance, can communities manage groundwater ecosystems by themselves uh, without much interference of government and all? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think, I think for the first part, I think I'll just direct explicitly the question to, I'll bring Rod in a bit to, to link to, Rod, you mentioned some policy changes that occurred. Um, in this one spring, you had a time series of, of recovery. And so maybe you could speak about um, some other um, initiatives that, that took place that weren't maybe formally under a protected area um, status or something like this, but had an effect on um, these uh, changing hydrographs and recovery. And then Melissa, maybe in your purview at the Nature Conservancy, maybe have some 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 more um, thoughts too on, on alternatives to protected um, areas um, in terms of ways to protect uh, GDEs, yeah. So well, either of you can start. I'll start. Um, so uh, I think the important message is, in, you know, to conserve uh, springs, which I think are the most dramatic groundwater dependent ecosystems, uh, particularly in arid landscapes. Um, ha things have to be done at both the, the, both the sort of global or government scale, aquifer scale. And, uh, and also at the local scale um, by local communities. And um, yeah, I gave a few examples of that in Australia where we've got that big basin-wide government-driven initiative to restore aquifer pressure and then the local examples of working with landholders to um, get tenure, tenure based security over those critical sites and also some of the management things that you need to do at local scales to preserve them. And I'm sure I'm sure those types of things, probably not identical, but those types of things need to happen all throughout the world's arid landscapes um, where, where there's a, a, where, that require aquifer management. Um, just in maybe reflecting a little bit on some of the previous questions, um, you know, it seems pretty obvious to me that in a country like Jordan, which has, you know, got 5 million people and very little rainfall and uh, no major streams, that um, desalination of seawater is going to be absolutely essential, not, not, not optional, <laughs> it's going to be absolutely essential. So for a lot of arid land, arid countries, they've got the same problem and we're going to have to look at seriously at um, making uh, desalination of seawater efficient and sustainable. Okay, I can jump in. So um, thanks for your question. I Actually, before I uh, worked at the Nature Conservancy, I did a lot of work in India. So I have a lot of fond memories working there. Um, so for your first question about uh, in places where there isn't regular like policies in place, what can be done? And and so ultimately one if it's impossible to have a sustainable groundwater management act, like it's not politically feasible at a time, there are other policies that can be made that can influence groundwater usage. And so that's a little bit of what Otso B and Fiona talked about, like looking at uh, how how different on wash initiatives or poverty reduction strategies or food security strategies can be, those policies can be devised with not particularly ecosystems as the main goal, but can have mutually beneficial benefits, uh, mutual, mutual benefits for the ecosystems and the, uh, those societies. And so it takes a little bit of creative um, masterminding to do that. And I'll give an example from India. So for instance, in, um, uh, in Gujarat, there was you know, massive groundwater depletion happening. And um, 
And one of the ways to control groundwater pumping without having sustainable groundwater management law was this thing called the GOT gram uh, scheme, which essentially changed how electricity was being provided to rural communities so that they could ensure that they were still providing electricity for domestic uses 24, um, uh, 24 seven, but the irrigation was being, um, the irrigation electricity was being regulated um, so that it was only occurring at night and at uh, off peak hours so that it, they were reducing um, electricity, uh, sorry, pumping of, of, uh, of groundwater for irrigation. And so they had basically rebuilt the entire electric grid <laughs> um, and they had three phase electricity grid for the um, higher uh, energy needed needs for irrigation. And then for uh, a, a, a one phase um, electricity grid for domestic uses. And so that was the government's way of regulating groundwater without having putting in meters, which would have had a huge transaction cost and without affecting other um, you know, food security or poverty um, reduction and initiatives. So that's just one example of how um, you can use other policy mechanisms to um, change groundwater usage. Um, there is a new ground, uh, like groundwater initiative in India called the National Groundwater Scheme, and it is requiring local agencies to um, devise um, water security plans locally. So it is possible that um, if uh, that those local entities could use data such as like from the global groundwater dependent ecosystem map or other publicly available data to when they're devising those local plans to integrate those ecosystem water needs locally. Another thing that that's very popular in India, obviously, are you know these like Gandhian NGO um, movements where um, NGOs are supporting panchayats and um, other local groups in divide, um, creating water harvesting structures. And these water harvesting structures increase recharge and get oftentimes increase the amount of crops that people can grow. But if they were done um, with ecosystems in mind, those water harvesting structures could be strategically placed so that they're increasing water supply for the rural community, but also uh, supporting that ecosystem. And so there are that's that's what's really great about having information and data is that if you have that knowledge, you can be more creative in how in the solutions that you can um, implement in order to achieve multiple goals. So I, I hope that answered your question. It looks like Otso B wants to add on. Yes, yes. And I want, I'm going to take the opportunity to share also the, the slide uh, that apparently didn't go through the first time. I'm hoping that it does now. But my point with this slide is, is to show that, you know, there are dynamics at play that transcend the community. So there is definitely a role for the community in the protection of ecosystems. But whether it is decisions that are being taken at, an, at another uh, point of the aquifer system that will affect ecosystem, uh, groundwater dependent ecosystem further along the road, or it is population movement that are happening for a number of reasons, it, it is very difficult for the solution to be strictly local. I mean, there is definitely an important role for communities, but that discussion really need to be scaled up uh, to, 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 and more systematic if we are going to have an impact because some community dynamics will lend themselves to protection. They will be, uh, a, for, for a number of reasons, more protected from you know, fragility or from you know, uh, irrigation or whatever other big uh, factors that could impact uh, the, the ecosystem but in other places, just their own uh, geographical situation will make any good local management insufficient to protect the GD. So there is really uh, a need to, to, to scale up the response and the awareness uh, about this, uh, this ecosystem to, 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 to the national level, frankly, and at minimum to, uh, to the aquifer system. Thank you. a couple of things just to say from our experience we've been really and this perhaps also relates to the question about Jordan as well just in terms of really um, 
undertaking a climate risk analysis to really build a narrative working with community groups or at a sub-national level. I mean, I think what also Fee has mentioned about the national level is really important, but also there's a lot of potential to really build capacity on how to undertake a climate risk analysis and then see how um, water levels, access to wash facilities, access to livelihoods and GDEs, for example, are going to be impacted and that builds the business case which goes back to Jordan because I think Jordan doesn't have the luxury of you know the next 40 years to get things together it's already very critical and certainly there's a lot of sensitivity certainly in Jordan on the use of desal because especially if it's so expensive Jordan doesn't have its own oil resort uh, reserves but then there's a lot of issues with in terms of um groundwater efficiency but just to say that um interesting to hear about the case about india and electricity and how the electricity was rationed but the transition to solar is also going to be a problem i know that in yemen there and in afghanistan there's been a huge take up and expansion of solar and because it's seen as being free which of course it's not but it's obviously much cheaper and you don't have the restrictions in terms of embargoes and physical uh, limitations in terms of fuel and the price uh instability and then you'll have then you're already having large changes in large drawdown in, in your aquifer levels so one important point i think of engagement in yemen is because of the political context it's also speaking to the tribal farmers to the tribal farmers who are growing using lots of water i think it's even 90 percent of the water in yemen for uh for agriculture including the production of cat which has a really high market value so then how do you engage with the tribal farm with, with the tribal groups to basically talk to them about the impact of their abstraction not today not tomorrow but actually in a very short time in Yemen. So I think that is a, an opportunity in such a fragile context where there's already huge impacts, but just a warning flag with solar as well. And the, when you don't have access to the fuel or even a, na a national grid that solar, if not managed properly, may pose challenges. Thanks. I just add to that, there's evidence of um, solar power being used as a remunerative, remunerative crop in Northern India, but in the, in the absence of certain policy arrangements that um, the expansion of solar power can actually drive greater uh, yeah, groundwater depletion. Um, I, I'll just add one thing and from a higher level, but I, I think a lot of the, the questions I think well, and, and, and responses, I think we can benefit a lot from, from how we frame the problem and how we frame the opportunity space. And I think a lot about how in the age of like pandemic and migrant crises and um, armed conflict, like no one other than uh, groundwater nerds are going to care about groundwater as the as a priority issue. And so it's around framing. It's around looking at the relationships between groundwater and uh, you know, economic productivity, uh, social well being, um, linking ecosystem well being to human well being through the concept of ecosystem services and trying to quantify that, but making those the policy objectives that are underpinned. Um, we had some discussion before around uh, changes in climate, right, as a, as a policy goal, um, and maybe protected areas, but groundwater is a, is a linking uh, resource that links changes in climate to changes in. So I, yeah, I, I feel also skeptical of the, the likelihood of, say, groundwater receiving, I mean, it's not explicitly called out in the SDGs, right, we, this is, um, you know, um, we know this, but, um, but underpinning goals that maybe have higher social relevance by the ways that the groundwater contributes to them, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to explore um, in that space. But it's, it's more of a, a framing thing, I think. We can accomplish more by reframing how we approach the problem. And did someone over here have a question before? OK. We also have yeah. a question in the chat, if, uh, a couple of questions in the chat. If, um, if folks... See one hand up in the back. Sure. So maybe we'll take this one and then. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Brincic coming from Slovenia. I'm a hydrogeologist. And I would, uh, would like to stress uh, that, uh, uh, that we are talking today about the groundwater dependent ecosystems on the surface. But we should not forget that we have also ecosystems in groundwater. We have ecosystem in karst aquifers mm -hmm. and karst are covering 12% of earth surface. So this is really something which is very important and we always forgetting this. And another thing I would like to ask, is there any consideration relating groundwater protection zones for drinking water supply and protected zones for groundwater ecosystems? Because sometimes they are overcovered. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Anyone want to take a first on the Zoom? 
Uh, I yeah, I want to. What was your name again, by the way? Yeah, Mihail. Okay, I thought uh, I um, I might have read some of your stuff. Um, so yes, this map does not map um, in aquifer groundwater dependent ecosystems. So like those um, mostly invertebrates or uh, or other species that are living within an aquifer or a karst system. Um, and so that's that's definitely one of the um, the we're only basically mapping expressions of groundwater. So things that are on the surface or rely on groundwater near the surface. So I want to acknowledge that. And that's a huge data gap. So if there are any PhD students out there that want to help answer that <laughs> question, I, I am very interested in hearing about that. Um, Xander, do you want to answer the second half of the question? Which was remind me? It was. Uh, did you want to restate it? I believe it was about the groundwatershed stuff of having it related to um, groundwater dependent ecosystems. Was that? Yeah, that's right. Did so I hear that right? Of, um, looking at the spatial co-occurrence, we could say of um, groundwatersheds with um, with maybe source water protection zones or something like this. Yeah. There is also there is also a large surface which is dedicated to the protection of drinking water sources. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Also protected zones. Yeah. Of course, there are many different practices around the world, but they are back in the space, so they are existing there. Is there any consideration how they are co-curing co and how can they help each other? Yeah, no, it's a good question, and I think it it also highlights a, a and I was rather told that we should wrap up because we're um, at the end of time and I think it's been a really wonderful discussion but um, it all and I don't know the specific answer to this but if it's we only included the protected areas that are included in the world database on protected areas and I'm not sure if source water protection zones or, or um, other mechanisms like them are included or not in this okay yes yeah so we didn't but I think this is a great um great reminder and um also another uh, come back, coming back to this discussion around framing around sort of these win-wins of or um, um you know overlapping um functions of protection for both um, drinking water and for uh gdes um so yeah thank you for that but that brings us to an end um i don't know um, if I, uh, I just want to add uh, one more thing um if we're going to be monitoring the chat um after the sessions and i know there's a couple questions in there so i'm going to and the rest of the presenters will um, respond to them. If there are members in the audience that also have questions, or there's something that comes up uh, that you are asking yourself, after, you know, as you're having coffee or dinner later tonight, feel free to um, add it to the chat on the website, and we'll be monitoring it for the next few days um, after this event and answer your questions. And and please feel free to reach out to us. This. Um, I would like to learn as much from you all as maybe you learned from us today and keep an open dialogue about this really important topic. So thank you all for coming to the session. And I hope those of you uh, luckily in Stockholm are enjoying yourselves and have a uh, great rest of the, uh, the World Water Week. Thank you.